Now, even though I have this given to you and you don't have to write notes, I need you to make sure you're paying attention and make sure that you're responsible because we are going to have a test on all this. Okay? Now, I want to preface this by saying that Ronald Reagan was elected president and he was elected in the election of 1980. So we're talking about March 30th, 1981 on his attempt at assassination. So how long has he been in office? Two months. When does he take office? January, January of? 81. So how long has he been in office? It's about 70 days. Okay, so it was very early in his presidency. Okay, now I just want to tell you a story about this before I start. I was student teaching. I already know this story. On this day, you're going to listen to it again. I was student teaching for Russ Davidson, who still teaches at Colstrip High School all these years. He's been in the same school. Great teacher. He comes storming in my room as I'm teaching a lecture, and he gets on the whiteboard, and whiteboards were like a brand new deal that year. We always had chalkboards before that. He got on the whiteboard, and he writes, Mr. Reagan has been shot. And I look at the board, and the kids look at the board, and we all think the same thing. We had a teacher by the name of Jim Reagan who the kids hated. <laughs> and I'm, I'm not lying. And I'm sitting there, I'm looking, I'm thinking to myself, God, I am in the wrong profession if we got teachers getting shot. Uh -huh. He put Mr. Reagan. Well, my, it was very early in my student teaching that Ronald Reagan had this attempt at assassination. Very unusual assassination. Why did he write it on the board? Why didn't he know that? First thing. Okay, well, he just did. Now, so let's start on this. Pay attention to your notes. At 1.45 p.m. on March 30th, 1981, President Reagan climbed into the presidential limousine at the White House. He was scheduled for a seven-minute drive to the Washington Hilton Hotel in downtown Washington, D.C., where the president was going to give a speech that afternoon. With the president were the following people. Michael Deaver, who was the president's closest advisor, Labor Secretary Ray Donovan, Secret Service Agents Drew Unruh, who was the driver of the presidential limousine, and Jerry Parr, who is the chief of the presidential protection detail assigned to President Reagan. Okay. So the president received a standing ovation as he entered the Hilton International Ballroom to address about 3,500 union representatives. And after his speech, he left the stage. He walked down a 100-yard carpeted corridor that led to the VIP exit out of the hotel. And I'll show you this on video. At 2.25 p.m., he emerged out the side door from the Washington Hilton, and flashing one of his usual jovial smiles. He was a very popular guy, smiled a lot, really people liked him. The presidential limousine was parked on the curb waiting for him. Not too far, probably from that wall to that wall, from where he walked out, he walked across and the presidential limousine was there. Agent Unruh was in the driver's seat of the limousine, they had the engine running. President Reagan raised his right hand, waving to people across the driveway, and the people that he was waving to included a number of newspapermen and members of the public. Agent Parr was at Reagan's right side, his aide Deaver was to his left, between the president and the group, big press group that was there. Press Secretary James Brady was a few steps behind Deaver, and Secret Service Agent Timothy McCarthy waited at the limousine standing by the open rear door waiting for the president to get in. Washington policeman Thomas Delahunty stood near the press rope kind of keeping the press and the people back from when the president was coming out. A familiar shout of Mr. President, Mr. President came from behind the rope and Associated Press reporter Michael Putzel was trying to ask Reagan a question. He said, Mr. President, Mr. President. Shortly after he made that comment, six shots rang out in the, from the crowd in the press corps, where other people were there as well. As the shots rang out, Agent Parr pushed the president's head down and shoved him hard through the open door of the limousine. The president was almost at the door when the shots were fired. Reagan's head actually struck the roof of the doorway of the limousine, and both men landed on the transmission hump of the rear seat. You know, there's a seat there, then kind of a hump, and then a seat, and that's a transmission. So he really pushed Reagan hard, bang, down on that transmission hump. 
Here's how the shots went. Shot number one hit press secretary Brady right in the forehead. Shot number two hit police officer Delahunty in the back of the neck. And you'll see this on video. The third shot missed the president and it hit a window in a building across the street. Michael Deaver, when he heard the first shot, kind of went like this, and that bullet went like it, just maybe an inch over his head. If he wouldn't have ducked and hit him in the back of the head, he kind of went like this, and the bullet went right over the back of his head and hit a window across the street. Shot number four hit Secret Service agent Timothy McCarthy in the stomach. Shot number five hit the window of the presidential limousine. And unfortunately for President Reagan, shot number six actually ricocheted off of the limousine and struck the president in the chest as he was being pushed in by par. So here's the window and he's pushed him in. I'm the president, I'm being pushed in. And the bullet hits the limousine and comes this way and hits him in the chest as he's pushing him in the limousine. Just kind of a freak. Well, because of that, no one knew the president had been hit. And we'll talk about that. So police and Secret Service men wrestled a 22 caliber pistol away from a man close to where President Reagan was walking. The man was later identified as John Hinckley Jr., age 25. In the presidential limousine after the shooting, Agent Parr did not realize that Reagan was hit. Finally, President Reagan complained to Parr and he said, Jerry, get off me, you're hurting my ribs, you really came down on me. And what happened is he, when he pushed him in, he did push him in really hard right on his chest on that transmission hub, and his chest was hurting. Parr apologized and helped the president sit upright in the rear seat, and he ran his hands over Reagan's body under his arms and across his back, to, and he detected no wound in the president. Reagan again began to complain to Parr that his ribs hurt and he was having trouble breathing. Then the president turned an ashen color, which might be about the color of this podium, and started to cough up some blood. So, first of all, what did Parr think? He thought he broke one of Reagan's ribs when he pushed him into the car. So that was his first thought. Well, when he saw blood coming from his mouth, he ordered Agent Unruh to rush to George Washington Hospital, which was about a mile and a half from the hill. They actually had taken off towards the White House, and when Parr figured out that something was wrong, they made a different strategy and went to George Washington University Hospital. By radio, Parr then advised the Secret Service of the White House by saying, Rawhide is heading for George Washington. Rawhide was Reagan's Secret Service code name, and the limousine was called Stagecoach. President Reagan was rushed into the hospital, and he soon passed out due to loss of blood. When the Secret Service agents lifted President Reagan onto the table in the trauma unit of the hospital is when they realized he had been hit, and Surgeon Dennis O'Leary removed a bullet that was lodged in the chest of the president, narrowly missing his heart, very, very close to his heart. Now, after surgery, O'Leary announced to the press, the president, at was, at was, excuse me, the president was at no time in any serious danger. He has a clear head and should be able to make decisions by tomorrow. That really wasn't accurate, because that bullet was close enough that it could have caused him some problem. Was he going to announce that to the nation? No. Well, the president actually remained in good spirits throughout the entire encounter. He made several humorous comments during this trying time, including when he saw his wife Nancy for the first time after the assassination attempt, he said, Honey, I forgot to duck. When he entered the operating room prior to surgery, he told the people, Please tell me you're all Republicans. And one of the surgeons responded by saying, Today, Mr. President, we're all Republicans. So he had a really good sense of humor in general, but especially at this time. Now, after spending 12 days at George Washington Hospital, President Reagan was sent home on April 11, 1981. He received cards and gifts from all over the nation. Many historians believe his popularity soared after surviving this assassination attempt. Immediately after Hinckley fired the six bullets at President Reagan, he was jumped and taken quickly into custody. In 1982, he was put on trial for attempting to assassinate the President of the United States. And since the entire assassination attempt had been caught on film, Hinckley's guilt was obvious. So his lawyers hammered at an insanity plea. He shot the president by reason of insanity. Well, anybody would have to be insane to do that. Well, on June 21, 1982, Hinckley was found not guilty by reason of insanity in all 13 counts against him on the botched assassination. 
and he was ordered by a federal judge to be placed in a mental institution at St. Elizabeth's Hospital, which is very close to Washington, D.C. Now, the reason Hinckley did this is he had a long history of mental problems. He was obsessed and had stalked actress Jodie Foster. Most of you probably know who she is. What? She don't have the hair. She has short hair. Yeah. Young. She was very young then. Based on Hinckley's view of the movie Taxi Driver, he hoped to rescue Foster by killing the president. Foster played a prostitute in that particular movie and was treated quite poorly, and Hinckley got an obsession for her, and he thought by killing the president, uh, it would ha somehow help rescue her. Um, it would, it would, this act, he thought, would guarantee Foster's affection for him. He had sent her several letters that she really discarded, and when they got to be too creepy, she actually turned them over to the police. But like she said in an interview, she gets lots of crazy mail. She didn't pay a lot of attention to it. Well, Hinckley has recently been awarded privileges which allow him to leave the hospital for several days at a time to visit his parents in Colorado. So that's kind of the attempted assassination of Ronald Reagan. I'm going to show it to you on tape here, and I think you'll get a good understanding, and we'll show you a few things. Is he still alive? Reagan? No. Hinckley's still alive. Zach, if you could get those lights and somebody could get those curtains, we'll be in business. He died... Oh, four? Yeah, maybe. I thought maybe... Was it been that long? It might be. Yeah. He was very popular president. Very popular. He wasn't so popular before this. Is, I think historians were correct that he actually became more popular after the assassination attempt than he may have would have been otherwise.